Hey everyone, so today we are lecturing through chapter 43, which is assisting with eye and ear care. We start with talking about the eye and ophthalmology, uh, which is the branch of medicine that specializes in the eye, uh, particularly in eye anatomy, the function of the eye, and diseases that affect your eye. So the most common disorders are corrected with glasses or contact lenses, so any uh, some type of corrective lens. But more serious problems uh, often will require medications and up to surgery, uh, which can only be done by an ophthalmologist. So um, there are differences between an ophthalmologist and an optometrist. An ophthalmologist is the one who prescribes medications and does the surgery to correct uh, disorders with the eye and treat diseases. An optometrist specializes in visual defects only, and they can prescribe the um, corrective lenses, so the glasses and the contacts. So I have um, pasted in here a diagram of both the frontal view of an eye, or the exterior view of an eye, and then the um, interior view of the eye. And these are all the different parts of your eyeball. So when we go over to page two here in just a second, um, we can be able to flip back here. Um, when you're doing this lecture on your own, you can flip back through the maps and see the different parts um, of uh, the eyeball that are affected in the different diseases that um, pertain to the eye. So you'll be able to see that um, this um, uh, iris and ciliary body and muscle and the choroid um, are what make up the uveal tract and that is where uveitis occurs, um, that the choroid and the retina, um, once the retina detaches from the choroid, that's retinal detachment, um, that, um, you know, conjunctivitis occurs here um, on uh, you know, the uh, outer layer of the eye uh, ball and so on. So we'll go through some of those diseases here. Um, and we will start with uh, diseases, uh, excuse me, disorders of the external eye structure. So there's blepharotitis, which is chronic inflammation of the eyelid's edges. It can be caused by infection or the same kind of skin condition that causes dandruff. Um, and so blepharotitis is, if we flip back here, it would be all around um, kind of where eyeliner goes, um, would be where you would uh, see blepharotitis. Um, ptosis, um, so blepharotitis more specifically would be kind of where the eyelashes meet the um, eyelids. So uh, ptosis is uh, upper eyelid drooping. It interferes with vision and oftentimes will end up eventually requiring surgical correction. So blepharotosis is uh, eyelid drooping. A sty is an eyelash follicle that uh, becomes infected. It's usually a staph infection uh, that occurs somewhere in one of those eyelash follicles. Um, so it's like an infected hair in your eyelashes. Um, most of the time a warm compress applied uh, frequently throughout the day will help burst that infection and help it drain out. So you can get styes up here anywhere you have eyelashes, um, you know, down here too. You can get them on your lower lashes. Disorders of the front eye, conjunctivitis is inflammation of the conjunctiva, which is caused by allergies, irritants, or infections. Conjunctivitis is also known as pink eye. It is highly contagious, um, especially because it's itchy, and so kids will oftentimes, or even adults, will um, scratch it, and then it gets under their um, fingernails, and then they'll scratch their other eye, and then it spreads, or you know they'll touch something, and then it spreads. So it's very contagious. Got to be really careful with the pink eye. 
Corneal, uh, corneal ulcers are abrasions that may be the result of an injury, um, an infection, or a combination of the two. Oftentimes you're going to need antibiotics to keep uh, an infection out and ointments to help with the pain or healing. So you can kind of see here, you can get conjunctivitis in the conjunctiva or um, corneal ulcers there. Disorders of internal eye structures, cataracts, uh, are a cloudy area in the lens of the otherwise clear uh, lens of the eye. Treatment is surgical lens replacement, so they will put a, um, oh, what is it called? Um, hold on, I can't think of the, the word I'm looking for, but like a synthetic um, replacement lens in there. And um, and then uh, it will be clear again for them to see, the person to see. Glaucoma uh, is fluid pressure buildup inside of the eye and uh, it leads to blindness eventually. Medications can help reduce the pressure uh, and iridotomy can help drain excess fluid from um, behind the um, or excuse me, uh, an iridotomy can help uh, drain that excess fluid to help relieve some of that pressure. So that can help prevent blindness as well. Uveitis is inflammation of the uveal tract, which is the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. There's an unknown cause. So if you're looking at that here, um, let me go back. Glaucoma, sorry, I keep flipping back and forth. I should have put this over here, but I wanted to try to get all these diseases and disorders on one page. Um, so glaucoma um, is the um, pressure on the inside of the eye, and uveitis is, uh, like I was telling you earlier, here's the iris, and then the ciliary body and muscle and then the choroid, and so when those become infected, that those make up your uveal tract, and so you end up getting uveitis. So when you get um, um, pressure from this fluid buildup back here, and, and um, it's, it needs to be drained, and so that's part of what's going on with um, glaucoma. But with glaucoma specifically, it is the, um, oh, excuse me, cataract was what I wanted to show you. Cataract is on the lens of the eye, so this lens here is normally clear, but if it becomes cloudy, it looks opaque, and so it's like putting a piece of scotch tape over the center of your eyeball, and so what would normally be clear would be masked and kind of milky looking, and so they would take that out uh, the lens out and put an artificial one. Artificial, that's the flipping word I was looking for. An artificial lens in there that is clear. Oh man. Okay, um, sometimes, you know, I just hate me while I'm lecturing. Um, okay, disorders of the retina. Uh, retinal detachment is uh, something that occurs when the um, Retina detaches from the underlying coronoid, cor excuse me, choroid layer, and it damages the vision. It has to be repaired with a cryopexy. Um, diabetic retinopathy is a complication of diabetes. Uh, blood vessels leak into the vitreous humor. There is no cure, but treatment can slow progression. So if we're looking at retinal detachment, this layer detaches from this layer. You can see they're pretty, you know, well put together there, so if this one detaches from this one, then that's not good. And for diabetic retinopathy, um, this these blood vessels start to leak into this vitreous humor, and so that's no good either. Macular degeneration is actually the leading cause of blindness in elderly in the United States. Um, and with macular degeneration, the central vision is lost first. And so um, actually my grandfather, my beloved grandfather, <laughs> has macular degeneration. And what happens is uh, it's quite sad to watch somebody progress through macular degeneration, um, especially if they are somebody who is as strong and independent as my grandfather is. Um, 
but what happens is uh, they get these things called floaters and they just look like dark spots. So, you know, sometimes if you stare at the sun too long, when, when we were kids, we would stare at the sun um, like idiots. <laughs> and when you look down away from the sun, then you get those black dots and those are floaters. And so you get these like little blacked out spots in your vision. And so with people that have macular degeneration, they have those, but they are permanent. And they first occur in the center of their field of vision. And so they have these black holes essentially in their center of uh, their field of vision, but they have the remaining peripheral vision. And so um, they eventually that hole in the center of their vision becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, um, you know, they can see perhaps um, some things at the beginning um, of their um, you know, you know, the immediate perimeter of their center vision, their peripheral vision is quite large, but then eventually as their macular degeneration progresses, their peripheral vision becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And so, you know, their, their level of blindness increases significantly. Um, there is some treatment options uh, that can prevent further deterioration, but there really is no cure for the existing damage. So um, my grandfather has had injections put into his eyeball to help prevent deterioration. Um, the injections do not last a significant amount of time and um, they have to be done, you know, fairly regularly. They are painful. As you can imagine, having a needle put into your eye is not a fun thing to do. Um, and um, one of the big things my mom, now macular degeneration is thought to be somewhat genetic. And so my mother has macular degeneration now as well. And so does one of my uncles. And um, the eye doctor, um, when I went for my eye exam last fall, and I told the eye doctor, I was like, my grandfather has macular degeneration, my mother has macular degeneration, uh, my uncle does, and the eye doctor uh, told me the same thing that uh, my mother and uncle's doctor and grandfather's doctor has told them, which is to take large amounts of um, a specific vitamin that helps to um, combat uh, macular degeneration and also to always wear sunglasses even if it's cloudy. If there's just a hint of sun you want to make sure that you're wearing sunglasses um, because sun definitely damages um, your eyes and uh, progresses macular degeneration quite rapidly. So if you have any macular degeneration in there then uh, in your family then you definitely want to be wearing your sunglasses and also also take um, this one specific type of uh, multivitamin. It's called ARIT81. It's like a combination of vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, beta carotene, zinc, and copper. Kind of all rolled into one and that's supposed to also help um, delay the effects of or um, help with uh, macular degeneration as well. All right, so moving down, disorders of the structures at the front of the eye. Conjunctivitis, oh, I already did that one, sorry. Disorders with eye movement, you have strabismus, which is where the eyes um, move uh, separately from one another. So your eyes are designed to move together and a deviation of one eye is called strabismus. And so, um, I don't know what y'all called it when you were younger, but, um, what I knew that to be called commonly was wall-eyed. And so um, if you think of, um, if you've ever seen a person um, where maybe one eye is looking straight and the other one is looking um, to the side or uh, one eye is focused in one direction or the other eye, and the other eye is focused in another direction, then that would be strabismus. Uh, amblyopia is often uh, known as a lazy eye and that occurs when um, the misaligned eye ends up becoming lazy and so it's often a side effect of strabismus or uh, or not necessarily being wall-eyed completely but having a little bit of a strabismus and then that misaligned eye becomes lazy and so a treatment uh, for amblyopia uh, becomes um, patches or is patches 
um, and so they'll patch the good eye and that forces the lazy eye to do more work um, and also glasses will be oftentimes used in conjunction with the patches um, to help force that lazy eye to do more work and become stronger and so um, in really extreme cases if the patches and the glasses don't work to force that lazy eye to uh, be stronger and to correct itself then uh, surgery may be needed Refractive disorders, these are really common, and um, so make sure you know the difference in these and be able to define these. Myopia is nearsightedness, and that is where a person can see nearby objects um, but and clearly, but they cannot see distant objects clearly. Hyperopia is farsightedness, and that is where they can see distant objects clearly, but not close up. Close objects are blurry. That is what I have. I can see things far away that are very clear, but if I take my glasses off, I can't see anything three inches in front of my face. Uh, presbyopia is a form of farsightedness that occurs with aging. It is secondary to a loss of accommodation of the lens. And lastly, astigmatism is uh, an unevenly curved lens, which causes vis vision distortion. Okay, so uh, page three covers ophthalmo uh, ophthalmic exams. So an eye exam is done with a couple of different instruments. Uh, it uses an op ophthalmoscope, which is an instrument used for an eye exam. It's handheld, it has a light to view uh, the inner structures of an eye. We have one of those back in our, uh, our um, ER room back there hanging on the wall. And so you can check one of those out next time you're in lab. A tonometer is used to detect glaucoma. It is the tool that measures intraocular pressure. Um, and so if you've had an eye exam, um, then you'll remember that it is the instrument that uses the puff of air that dries your eye out. Um, and so it doesn't hurt, it just kind of startles you a little bit um, when it puffs the air into your eye to dry the eye out so that they can check for intraocular pressure. A slit lamp is the magnifying lens and light source. Um, it's used to examine the frontal structures of the eye, including the eyelids, the iris, the cornea, and the lens. Um, and this is the instrument, if you've had an eye exam, where you put your chin into the little rest and tilt your forehead uh, up against the head bar and stare straight ahead while the light is um, brought in really close to your eye and shined directly into your eyeball. Um, and then they tell you not to blink. A refraction exam is um, something that verifies the need for corrective lenses, and so it uses uh, an instrument called a retinoscope. It is the test, um, if you've had an eye exam done, where they um, bring the thing down over to your face and it um, looks like a huge mask and you look through the little lenses and then the um, doctor will flip through the lenses and ask you which one is clear, one or two, two or three, three or four, four or five. And so they keep flipping through the lenses to ask you which one is the most clear. Um, and then that is how they determine what your prescription for corrective lenses will be. The ophthalmological procedures and treatments, uh, installation is administering medications into the eye. When doing so, you want to be careful not to injure the eye, um, also not to contaminate the medication by touching the tip of the bottle or um, the tip of the, the uh, medication dispenser into uh, the eye. So you want to make sure that you're not um, ever touching anything to the actual eyeball. You just want to hover it over the eye and drop it in. Also, you want to make sure that you dispense most medications into the inner corner of the eye and then have the patient roll their eye outward and down to the left um, to help kind of roll the medication back and forth um, around underneath their eyelids. Um, when you are installing, uh, instilling medications into the eye, you want to make sure that the patients do not rub their eyes. If liquids, um, you know, drip out from the installation, then you can hand them a tissue and just have them gently pat, but definitely don't rub after medications have been uh, administered into the eye. For eye irrigation, that is flushing out foreign materials from the eye. Typically, we use sterile water uh, or sterile solution that is formulated for irrigation. Um, sometimes it's um, we use something a solution called lactated ringers. 
um, that is uh, formulated for eye irrigation. And so basically you flush the eye, so you'll have the patient tilt their head and then flush the eye from the inner corner out to uh, help promote um, whatever it is to go out to the um, edge. Uh, vision screening. A Snellen chart is uh, the uh, test done for distance vision. It is uh, a chart that hangs 20 feet from where the patient stands. It uses letters or symbols. There are various charts available. There is one with um, sailboats and balls and um, teddy bears, I think, things like that for um, school-aged children who are not yet able to read letters or recognize letters. There are the standard Snellen chart is the one that we have in our lab, and that is the one that uh, has uh, English letters on it, and so that's the one that is most often used for those who are able to read um, and write English and uh, most adults. And then there is also a non-English speaking chart um, that is composed of letter uh, the uh, variations of the letter E pointed in different directions. And so for that chart, you would just have the patient point their fingers um, in the um, pattern of an E, so there are three fingers in whatever direction the prongs on the E are facing on the chart for whichever symbol um, you are pointing at on the chart. Uh, the Jagger chart is um, a test that tests near vision. The Ishihara plates, I showed you those in class, or um, if, I, if you haven't seen them, I will show you those in class. Those test color vision um, with a series of red and green dots. Um, so those are pretty cool. There's also pictures of these in your textbook as well when you go through the Learn Smart assignment. Contrast sensitivity tests the ability to distinguish um, varying shades of gray. So there's a lot of different vision screening tests that um, are available uh, for basic in-office vision screening as well. All right, so page four moves on to ear diseases uh, and disorders. Um, we start with the defi definition of an otologist, and that is an ear specialist that treats diseases and disorders of the ears. Starting with outer ear disorders, um, cerumen, which is the uh, term for earwax. So cerumen ear, uh, impaction is impacted earwax. Uh, earwax can build up and harden, um, which then impedes hearing or um, affects the way that people can hear. You can imagine if it's like, you know, if you have something stuck in your ear, it can affect the way that you hear. And so wax can be softened with drops uh, and then uh, irrigated to be removed. Otitis externa is swimmer's ear and it is a fungal infection secondary to persistent moisture in the ear canal. Bacteria can also cause ex otitis externa, um, but is typically uh, found um, in those uh, patients who have constant um, moisture in their ears, so a lot of times swimmers get it, and so that's kind of how it ended up with the nickname swimmer's ear. Pruritus is an itching uh, in the ear canal. It is common in the elderly as their ears dry out, and that is because um, their sebaceous glands produce less wax as they age. So mineral oil can help treat that and keep their ears, uh, their inner ears, uh, ear canals lubricated and um, help with the itching. Middle ear disorders, you have otitis media, which is a middle ear inflammation and fluid buildup. Uh, it's more commonly known as an ear infection. So you see a lot of those. Mastoiditis is the inflammation of the mastoid bone which is connected to the middle ear by air cells and sinuses in the bone. If you want to know where your mastoid bone is, if you feel right behind your ear, that bone that is right behind your earlobe is your mastoid bone. So mastoiditis is pretty serious because of its proximity to the hearing organs, the jugular vein, and the dura mater, dura, dura mater excuse me, that covers your brain. Um, so it needs to be treated very quickly uh, with antibiotics. Otosclerosis occurs when the bone tissue grows abnormally around the stapes, which is the stirrup. You've got those three little bones, tiny bones inside your ear, um, inside the middle ear, and um, the stapes is one of them. It's the stirrup. 
And so when this uh, bone tissue grows up normally around the stapes or the stirrup, um, it is the innermost of the three tiny bones the, that connect the uh, eardrum and the inner ear. And so that makes it so that the stapes can't move, which then causes hearing loss. Tinnitus is ringing in the ears, um, and that is a symptom of otosclerosis. Um, it's commonly one of the first symptoms. So um, if a, a patient has persistent tinnitus, then um, it, it may be worth looking into because there may be some otosclerosis happening in there. A ruptured eardrum can be caused by a number of things, a sharp object inside, you know, pushed down inside the ear, an explosion, a blow to the ear, like getting hit in the head, um, or a blow, you know, hitting, getting hit, getting hit in the ear, uh, a sudden change in pressure, or a severe middle ear infection. All of those things, uh, along with a number of other things, can cause an eardrum to rupture. Um, usually they'll heal on, their, heal on their own after a few weeks, but if it doesn't, then there may need to be a patch applied to the eardrum to help it heal. Moving on over to uh, inner ear disorders, you have labyrinthitis, which is an infection of the labyrinth. It is usually caused by a virus, um, and in case you were wondering what the labyrinth is, it includes the semicircular canals that help with balance. So balance may be affected in a patient that has labyrinthitis, so um, we would want to provide some education there. Uh, as well and let them know that they may have a greater fall risk. Meniere's disease is an increased amount of fluid in the labyrinth. There's a, the pressure of extra fluid disturbs the balance and then can rupture the labyrinth wall or damage the cochlea. There are often flu-like symptoms initially um, that accompany Meniere's disease, and so it goes undiagnosed a lot of the times uh, initially um, until they start to experience vertigo and they have all these other symptoms which will then prompt further testing. Uh, <clears throat> meds can help with the vertigo or the dizziness. Also, a low sodium diet can help with fluid retention to help decrease the uh, extra pressure or the extra fluid um, that um, you know, it tends to build up in there. Presbyscus is a, a type of hearing loss that is most common in older adults. Hearing aids are the common uh, help for this disorder. And then again, tinnitus is ringing in the ears. It's sometimes more like a buzzing, a whistling or a hissing sound, so it's not always uh, ringing causes commonly are damage to hearing receptors from noises or toxins, environmental toxins. Um, age is a factor here, and then also the long term use of NSAIDs like aspirin, um, excuse me, uh, like ibuprofen or other types of uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory uh, medications. All right, last page. Uh, hearing loss. There are a few types of hearing loss that you need to be aware of. There's conductive, which is caused by an interruption in the transmission of sound waves to the inner ear, typically caused by the an obstruction of the ear canal. Um, it looks like I went through here with my eraser and didn't catch it. Sorry about that. Um, the middle ear infections can also cause conductive hearing loss, and so can otosclerosis. Sensioneural hearing loss occurs with damage to the inner ear, to the nerve uh, that leads from the ear to the brain, or to the brain itself. Noise pollution hearing loss is um, caused by prolonged exposure to loud noises, um, and that happens because of damage to sensitive cells in the cochlea over you know, a long period of time. Ear protection is really important, so if you work in a really noisy place or um, you often find yourself in very noisy places, um, then you want to make sure you always have earplugs in. Hearing implants, uh, excuse me, hearing impairments uh, happen at all ages. Um, shouting may make it worse. If you um, are shouting at a person that has a hearing impairment, you want to make sure that you are speaking at a reasonable volume and not shouting. Um, and also speak uh, clearly so that lip movements can be seen. 
Most importantly, when you are communicating with somebody that has a hearing impairment, understand that they may not be completely uh, void of hearing, that they may be able to hear somewhat, and they may be reading your lips, um, and they um, most importantly need you to be patient with them. Treatments and procedures for hearing loss um, and ear disorders. We have medications um, to treat some infections and disorders. So drops and ear irrigations help treat um, infections and inflammations. They help relieve pain. They help loosen up uh, impacted waxes. Earwax removal um, can help treat with the treatment of uh, wax buildup. Um, sorry, I had to pause you. Indy saw something outside. Um, so ear wax um, removal uh, is done when wax is build, uh, has built up in a patient's ear. Um, the wax buildup can cause a full feeling, feeling in the ear and can cause hearing loss. So a lot of times um, people use Q-tips. I am guilty of this. I use Q-tips every single day. I have been doing it for my entire life, I'm pretty sure. Um, and uh, the problem with Q-tips, though, is that they can push wax down into the ear canal and end up worsening the problem. So in that case, ear curettes can help, um, and they look very much like um, the ocular loops that you learned about during the surgical instrument unit. Um, so if you remember that, that's kind of what an ear curette looks like. The um, ear curettes can help, and ear irrigation can help as well. Irrigation is contraindicated on a patient with a ruptured eardrum, a patient who has tubes in their ears, or a patient with an active ear infection, um, or any patient who has had ear surgery. So we want to make sure that we are not doing ear irrigations on those patients. Hearing aids make sounds louder, um, and so those are um, ideal for patients who need to have sounds amplified. Um, an audiologist will test hearing and then prescribe the hearing aid. Most will require batteries and normal care and upkeep. Um, and so hearing aids last a couple of years typically and then they'll have to be replaced. Um, and uh, a lot of times hearing aids now are very small and so they are designed to be um, you know, hardly noticed when patients are wearing them. But they do require maintenance, upkeep, normal care. Um, and um, uh, are helpful for those who need to um, have some uh, help with making sounds louder. The cochlear implant is an electronic device that helps restore hearing. It is an actually implanted behind the ear. It does uh, make, does it make sounds louder like the hearing aid does? Instead, it does the work of the cochlea to provi provide sound signals to the brain. So it um, tra transmits sound signals to the brain um, instead of amplifying sounds like a hearing aid does. So it is, um, works, it also is a hearing, um, assistive device, but it does not function the same that a hearing aid does. So make sure you understand the difference between those two. Okay, so I think that's it for um, the eyes and the ears. Um, if you have any questions, let me know.